you all should be hearing me just about now. I know my neighbors did. <laughs> all right, so we are going to hang out for a little bit. Just to jawbone a little bit here. Give me one second here. Get me. My car likes to yell at me for not putting my seatbelt on. Yes, I break the law in that regard. But for this one, I guess I'll have to wear it because it'll chime and chime and chime for a minute before it turns off. All right, so uh, this week we had some non-farm payroll action. And in case you're wondering, if you don't want to be sitting through this, that it should be recorded. So that way you guys know that I sit here and listen to this. You can come back to it later, I'm assuming. So one of the things that come up a lot is why do I stay away from trading on Thursday and Friday or even the afternoon session on Wednesdays on the first week of each month? And it's only to do with the inconsistencies with the market symmetry and the things that I call a signature and price action. Uh, they will come in and out. Uh, they'll be hit and miss type setups. I've learned over the years that it's just better for me not to take these trading days with live money because the probabilities are much uh, much lower than they are when they're not on those particular days. Not, not, not the same as like a FOMC, like a FOMC day, I can sometimes do go in after the FOMC announcement because it's created volatility. But ahead of the FOMC, I won't I won't be in front of that because it's basically a gamble. You don't know what they're going to do. Uh, for non-farm payroll, uh, the elements about that week and what you've learned hopefully this week was that in the beginning of the week, this is what I teach my students, that Monday, Tuesday is kind of like your honeypot. You want to go into the market looking for your setups there. And if you don't find it, try to force it. You don't you know, insist upon taking a trade. But if it presents it, you try to take it then. And then at the New York session on Wednesday, that's like your cutoff time. It's closing time. If you, you, know, if you want to go in after that, just know that you're gambling. You're not doing what I've taught you. And high fiving me and putting up your trades and tweeting to me saying, you know, thanks, ICT. Me for that, because I told you not to do it. <laughs> okay, so if you made money, uh, that's on you, you know. And if you lost money, guess what? That's on you too. But I I see a lot of folks that will post, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And apparently they're not listening. Because here's what I think on Thursday and Friday, you shouldn't have been trading. That's what I think. And what do you do on those days? Well, basically, you're students, okay? You're learning, and even if you've been trading for a while, if you're listening to me, you are a student, okay? You're learning what it is that I do. Whether you're going to use it or not, you're a student. So you don't want to be doing the things that I'm telling you not to do, because if you do that, you're wasting your time under my tutelage. You're not going to, you're not going to benefit from it. Uh, apparently, some people like to come, and they'll say, hey, look, you know, ICT says, don't do this, but I made money over here. Okay, that's fine. When, when it rains, it rains on everybody. Okay, that doesn't mean that you did something right that day. It just means that this, you know, when I first started making money years ago, back in the 90s, you know, I had nine months of sheer luck. Luck, folks. And it's not painful for me to say now. It was painful at the time to admit to myself that I wasn't as good as I thought it was. Like, I thought that books that I purchased and VCR tapes and CDs and everything else. Well, not CDs, but uh, DVDs were coming up then. And uh, I thought that that logic was building me into a juggernaut. And, well, the only thing that was a juggernaut is how fast I blew the accounts. Because <laughs> once, once the market started going into a trader's environment where everything stopped going parabolically one direction up, uh, I discovered that I didn't know how to trade. And that was very painful to watch me blow not one, not two, not three, not four, but five accounts, five accounts in one year in the 90s, trying to force what I thought the books were working for me initially with. And it's it's a terrible experience. But 
when I tell you these things, what to avoid, what not to be doing. And then I see folks going out and doing the very thing I tell you not to do. And the worst thing that can happen is for you to find short-term success doing the things I tell you not to do. That's exactly the equivalent of what I was doing for nine months in 1993. And it was not skill. That was luck. And you were lucky if you made money on Thursday. You were lucky on Friday if you made money. Now that the dust has settled, it's Saturday. If you look at the five-minute price action on the E-mini S&P. Now, I don't have a chart in front of me, but I know what it looked like. It was very boring. Very sloppy. Yes, there was a setup. Yes, there was a few little tiny little scalps. But if you were in there looking for a particular run that would be framed with a larger degree of probability, not something just on a one minute basis. And when I'm looking at trades, I'm going to be all over the place. So that way, you know, um, I'm, it's probably going to be difficult for some of you guys are sticklers about why don't I just stay on one topic? I'm, I'm not going to be able to stay on a topic because I'm literally speaking as I, my mind goes. So this is what it's like to be in my head. I, I may not completely co close a topic. And if I don't add it on something, obviously just tweet it to me in response to this post or this recording. And then I'll address it if it's something that's noteworthy. If it's something that's already been mentioned in other videos or things, and I'll pretty much just, you know, I'll like your comment saying I read it, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to answer it because I've already answered it somewhere else. But when I see folks posting that, you know, hey, you know, thanks ICT, I made this much money on Thursday or Friday of non-farm payroll week. <clears throat> I'm not going to, I'm not going to high five that. Not because I'm ignoring you, not because I'm trying to be ignorant, but I'm trying to show you that you're doing the opposite of what I'm telling you to do. And some of you just simply want to have those war scars. Like you want to be able to go through what I went through or anybody else that blows accounts. And, you know, I got the war scars to prove I earned my stripes. If I could go back in time and I could have someone like what I'm trying to be, I'm doing my best to be the very thing that I was wanting to be, or not wanting to be, but wanting to learn from someone that had the experience, had gone through the pain, suffered, lost real money, and then found a way to make money. That's somebody that I would have completely subscribed to, absolutely took everything they would have said to heart. And that's my motivation in doing all this stuff. Because if I can save one of you from putting yourself through what I put myself through, then it's a success for me. But it's almost like a confessional too, because you know a lot of you look up to me as like this superhero kind of guy. And you, you view me as something that I'm not. I'm, I'm not like what many of you attribute characteristics like... It's undeserved. I'm an average little person. Okay. I'm not really a big deal. I came from a small town and I was fortunate to find my way in certain circumstances, certain chance meetings, and I've been blessed by a really big God. And that's who's behind me. That's that's where I get the tenacity to stay with it. And that's who kept me going when I didn't have an ICT encouraging me. It would have been great for me to have somebody to sit down like this and kind of like, just talk, just talk to me, be a friend, be someone to encourage me because I was in tears just about every other day back in the nineties. I was so frustrated. I used to work and I'm thinking about it right now as I'm driving on Saturdays, I would get up real early and I used to do a vending route for a guy out in uh, Owings Mills, Maryland. And I didn't make very much money, and you've all heard this story before, but I had to go service a nursing home on, I can't remember the name of the road, <laughs> it'll come to me, Fayette Street, downtown in Baltimore. Not a really good neighborhood, and I was always wondering if I was going to get robbed, but I never did. But I spent five hours of my Saturday as a young man just turning uh, 20 years old, freshly uh, divorced. And I uh, 
would waste five hours of my Saturday servicing one account. And I would hate my life. Like I hated it. I hated the fact that I knew my friends and my family were home. Like you probably are right now. Some of you are probably working. Some of you are listening at your job <laughs> and you're cheating your boss. But I hated my life on these days. So every Saturday I go out and I take a drive. Now I'll cycle through both of my Corvettes because I got to keep them moving and keep the battery life on because I don't put a lot of miles on them. But I'm thinking out loud like I usually do on Saturdays where I reflect on when I was a younger man before I knew what I know now. And I was only making $315 a week. 50 of it was paid in under the table in cash for servicing that Saturday account. It would take me five hours to get up, drive out to Owens Mills from where I lived, pick the truck up, load up the things that I need to put in the vending machines and go service it, drive down to Fayette Street, then drive back up to Owens Mills, fuel the truck up, do the whole thing. And the whole time I'm looking at the clock thinking, I'm never going to be able to see my girlfriend on time. She's going to be upset. And the whole thing, every one of you young guys are thinking all the time. I, that was me. I did the same stuff. But while I was working and while I was driving to and from, I was looking for a way that I could come out of that. And I wanted to start my own vending business. Like I was going to cut throat the guy I was working with because he was underpaying me. He took advantage of me because his view was, and this is what happened. I was sitting in the, <clears throat> the back of the warehouse after one of my uh, route days and the guy's father who really owned the business came in and real, real snooty uh, Jewish man. Not that there's anything against Jews or anything like that, but th this guy was a hard liner. Just, you know, if you're not Jewish, then you're nobody. And he said that, where's that young guy? You know, where'd you, where'd you find him at? Cause I was always wanting to learn how to fix the machines. Like I wanted to know everything. Cause my intentions were I'm going to make my own vending business. I didn't want to be an employee. I knew that when I was younger. But I heard him say, where'd you, where'd you get him from? And he's like, uh, he, he applied and he was the one that kept calling wanting the job. So, and he comes, he never misses a day, never misses a day. He's like, he looks like he's from Essex, Maryland. He goes, he is. He goes, yeah, you got to watch those guys from Essex. I literally wanted to crawl under a rock at that time. And that, that day struck a fire under my ass. I was like, you son of a bitch. Let me tell you what money making is all about. I'm going to find a way and I'm going to, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to show you sons of bitches what real money is. I crept underneath the dock door so that way they wouldn't hear me. Cause I think at the time, Glenn, who was the, the boss, the manager, the son of the owner, his dad, Marty, he, uh, he said something that day that literally got under my skin. And I was like, who the hell do you think you are? Now, let me paint a picture for you. This guy, he owned a lot of Section 8 real estate down in Baltimore. Made $30,000 a month in Section 8 income. Living as a slumlord. Okay? His vending business, he had three routes. I ran one of them. My route did $147,000. And the, I guess that was, a, that was the middle route. The largest one was ran by his cousin. And there was another guy that ran a smaller route that I think he did like $100,000. And granted, the business was 50-50, you know, whatever you paid, you basically made that. And then you had to take costs of any kind of employee or whatever. And we just simply got really dirt income. That day when I went home, I talked to my uncle. And this is why I believe college is a scam. Okay. And I say it all the time. College is an absolute friggin' scam. Uh, I went to school after High school, did all the accelerated learning, all the additional things, and I was very high in math, science, and computer programming and operations. I was into all that stuff when I was in sixth grade. I was making my own programs, making my own video games, okay? It is what it is. Now, today, all the programming languages that are available, I don't, I don't keep up with it because I'm not trying to be a computer programmer. I'm not trying to be an employee, and I could care less, but that day when I came home and that employer of mine offended me without knowing that he offended me. Obviously, I couldn't quit because I needed the money. But I talked to my uncle, who was a 
University of Maryland graduate in finance and business management. And I said to him, I said, you know, what would you do if this happened? And I explained what I just told you. And he was like, what did I ask? Like, did you say anything to him? I said, no, I was embarrassed. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm from Middle River, which is across the street, basically, from Essex, which is down the street from Dundalk, Maryland. <laughs> okay. And they are like the armpits of Maryland. Okay. They, they, as far as like white trash, like that's, that's the areas where you see it from. And I can say that because I came up from it. So a lot of good people live in there and they still do. But generally, you know, you get the rough riders from that area. And some folks that are from this area, when they hear me talk, they can hear like when I say use, like a, that's a that's a slang that you can basically tell if somebody's from, you know, Middle River, Essex, Dundalk, that vicinity. We all have that kind of vernacular, that little uh, accent. But my uncle told me, he said, you know, you just got to get yourself a good education and just pursue what you were in, in, in school for. I said, I don't want to do it. Like, I don't want to do it. I, when I got out, I couldn't get a job with all the programming. I couldn't do it. I studied COBOL, CICS, Pascal, BASIC, C++. And I didn't want to be in the video game making. Like, I didn't want to do that. At the time, the visibility, and I was really wrong. I didn't see that as a industry that would have been growing because I watched it transform so much from like Atari 25 or 2600 when I was a kid. We all have PlayStation and Xboxes now, but when I was a kid, it was Atari 2600. Like if you weren't it, if you didn't have that. <laughs> okay. So I've watched all the transitions and I was like, you know, I just think it evolves too fast and I just don't see myself being able to do that. But I was wrong in that regard because if I would have gotten into game making, I probably would have done well. <clears throat> but, and I know this probably has nothing to do with trading. And some of you are like, man, get to the point. The point is, is you all ask how I think and interpret and how I got to where I am and how do I get through all the, the struggles? Well, this is one of those struggles that lit a fire under my ass. A boss literally basically said that I was trash. Didn't say the words trash, but that's what it is. So when I talked to my uncle that day, when, uh, came home because I actually lived with them. I rented a room, room and board, $50 a week. And I told him, I said, Uncle Stan, I, like, I'm mad. Like, I'm pissed off at this guy. Like, I want to go back and tell him off. But if I do, he's going to fire me. He's like, well, the best way to, to live well is, I'm sorry, the best revenge is to live well. You know, just go and do something better for yourself. And then when it's time, leave. But I didn't have an answer for how to do that. Like, I didn't know what it is that I would be doing to make money. Not that I was making a lot of it under them, but I spent an average of 13 hours a day doing that garbage job and listening to his lies saying, I'm going to make you a route manager one day and you would be $500 a week. Now, $500 a week back then in 1990, what, two, 91? Uh, yeah, 91. I literally swallowed that hook, line, and sinker thinking $500. That's mad money. Like, that's crazy money back then. $500 is nothing. Like, my stop loss. <laughs> my stop loss per tick is like that now. So the bottom line is I was pissed off and I wanted to find a way. I wanted to find a way to get out of that situation. And my uncle's advice was go back to school and pursue more of the, the languages that are available today. Now, this is a guy who I love. He was a father figure in a period of my time of, of growing up. He let me move into his home and they, they treated me very good. But this is the same person. And this is what I said. Don't take life advice from people that have a lot of drama in their, their life. And there's, there's people out there that critique me very hard. And they assume the things I talk about and say aren't good advice. But if you look around, there's a lot of folks since I've been public teaching they're showing the results. You know, they're doing those funded accounts. You know, they're, I'm, I'm seeing people getting paid, not just the acceptance of these funded accounts. And I'm not going to sit here and rep anyone's company because I don't have any affiliation. And please, if you're part of those companies, don't reach out to me anymore because I'm not going to, you know, rep you. I'm not, I don't do those things. 
just like brokers, I don't rep a broker either. I'm not introducing broker. I'm not trying to get you to do anything except for invest in time with yourself and believe in yourself because I'm telling you right now, going to college is the biggest fucking scam you'll ever do. And I don't care if you make money because you went to college. The world has changed. Look around. Look around. People have no idea what's about to come. They have no idea what's coming. I've been talking to my students, telling them before Trump got elected, I said all this stuff was coming. It's in video, it's documented, period. The things that are coming, you're not ready for. Your job is not guaranteed. Your boss thinks the same way about you, like I just described my old boss when I was a young man. They're not going to tell you because they can get a lot of trouble today where, you know, back then, a lot of things, you know, you can get away with a lot of things back then. But I was taking advice from a guy that went to college, graduated a very high GPA, business management, a math scholar. But he was managing a Kentucky Fried Chicken. KFC. Yeah. Here's my uncle, the guy I learned about trading from, who couldn't make money outside of the first initial plunge into it, where he made money to, to buy a condominium down at Ocean City in sugar. And he told me when I was 15 years old and 16 years old, every Sunday at my grandmother's, the richest people in the world, Michael, Trade futures and options. Get yourself a good job. Become an electronic tech technician. Save up. Invest. And live like the fat cats. <laughs> well, at 15 and 16, you know, hearing that, I'm interested in martial arts. <laughs> okay, I'm going to run my own martial arts school. I'm not interested in all that stuff. It sounds like the stock market. That's, that's, that's over my pay grade as a kid. I'm not interested. I hadn't really worked yet. And then when I started working, I was thinking, this sucks. You know, first job was a dishwasher at Gerspec's grocery store. But I looked at my uncle that day and I told him, I said, can I, can I tell you something? And I want you to know that I'm saying this with love and I just want to know things better. But how do you feel knowing that you wasted six years of your life in college and all the bullshit that you subscribe to and the books that you paid for, all that prep work, all that stress and crunching numbers, all that stuff. And you're working at Kentucky Fried Chicken, managing kids that don't want to come to work. And then you got to stay and do their job. You did all of that as a result of spending time and the money. He paid out of his pocket, folks. He didn't have, what is what, that's it, uh, financial aid. Again, he didn't have those things. He paid for it with his jobs and savings and money, and he cut grass, and that's what he does today. He's a retired man. He doesn't even trade, and he's got his own little grass-cutting business. So he, he puts a little bit of bread in that, and he's got a, a pension from Verizon where, where he re retired from. But he was not successful as a trader. He was not successful as a college graduate with ex ex exemplary marks in school like his grades were great and to talk to him he's a very intelligent guy very intelligent but down to earth too and i i love talking to him i don't talk to him as much anymore but that day when i asked him that it was like i crushed his soul and it was not my intention folks it was not that it, it was not my intention but i i wanted to know have you uh, have you observed have you noticed that you worked your ass off and you told me to do those things and I did it. And guess what? Both of us are in the same position. We can't use the shit that we paid for in school. Nobody, nobody wants. Hang on, this guy's getting ready to try to do it. Can you slow down, fucker? This guy's literally trying to fucking run me off the fucking one way bridge here. <laughs> Give me a fucking dickhead. All right, get out and beat this motherfucker's ass. Stupid bitch. Told you I was bipolar. <laughs> Apologize for that. So I asked the guy, 
among my uncle rather, and I said, listen, you know, do you honestly believe that that was the best decision for you and I? Like, I took your advice. I listened. And nothing came from that. And the, the look in his eye was like, literally, like, man, it was noticeable to you. <laughs> I don't know if he was ignoring it, like, like the elephant in the room. But I know my aunt, who was married to him, looked at him like, you know, he worked really hard. And this is never talk about it. You never could make it work. He went on so many interviews, so many interviews, and they never hired him. And I never got an interview. Not one time, all of the resumes I put out. And I had a better GPA than he did. Not one interview. So I wasted my time, I wasted my money in a field that was the future. Programming, technology, and information systems. I wanted to be a systems analyst. And guess what? I was a vending machine operator. I filled coffee machines and candy machines and soda machines, and I could take them apart and put them back together. I could tell you what's wrong with them without even being on that location. But it didn't pay money unless I owned the route. And then one day, while I was doing the vending route, the conclusion came to me that, you know, even if I have this vending route, if I have a route like this, that means I got to hire somebody. Do I trust somebody to be able to take the cash out of the machine and bring all the money to me? Because I got robbed one time. They broke into the back of the truck. They literally pulled the safe that was bolted in the back of the uh, Isuzu truck. They ripped the whole safe off the back truck that was bolted in. Ripped the whole entire thing out. And when I came out of the, the site, to put the remainders in the stale stuff that I take out of machines. And I saw the door ripped off and the safe missing. I was gutted. I'm like, the first thing it came to my mind was they're going to think I did it. That was exactly what I thought. Why did I think that? Why would I go to that conclusion immediately? Because of that piece of shit that you got to watch those guys from Essex. And I've been honest. I hadn't I haven't even missed a day. <laughs> I've never missed a day. I came to work all the time. But these people broke into, stole that cash. And I literally was ashamed that it happened on my route. Like I could have somehow prevented it. I couldn't have. I was inside doing the, doing the service on the, on the machines. So I sat there for 10 minutes trying to figure out how am I going to work up the, the courage to call in and tell my boss that I just got robbed. Thankfully, not at gunpoint or anything like that. But I had to sit there and wrestle with, hey, this is what it feels like to be violated. I've never experienced something like that before. I've never had that moment where something was taken from me and it wasn't mine and that makes it even worse. But when I called in, When I called in to, to talk to the owner of the company, I said, um, I just got robbed. What? Yeah, I just got robbed. And he's like, are you okay? And that made me feel better that he was at least asking that. And I said, I'm fine. I just came out of the site with, with the site I was at. And I said, they tore the door off the back. So it was a roll-up door that's going to cost you money. And they ripped the entire safe off the floor. Like it's gone. Like it's completely gone. And he goes, did he have any video camera back there and like that? Any kind of guards? And I was like, there's nothing here, dude. Like, this is the site I'm at. And it was like a dilapidated old rubber hose making company. So it was almost a failing company. So there was not a lot of technology back then. And nobody was really worried about guarding a place like that. So apparently somebody followed me around, tracked me, and then figured that was the place they were going to do it. And it was. It was like the third stop away from my last of the day. So all the money that would have been in there, you know, it was theirs. Well, when I got back to the shop, the owner's son, Glenn, who I had an affinity for, even though his dad's a dick, I, uh, I saw an entrepreneur magazine 
sitting on his desk. And I was looking at it, and I'm thinking to myself, entrepreneur. Remember that day when you said you were going to be a martial arts instructor, and you got all the credentials to do it, but you never did it. Here you are, feeling vending machines, you just got robbed, and you feel like shit. So I picked it up, so I thumbing through it. And I saw things in the magazine that I liked, like they were like pictures of boats and stuff, yachts and things like that. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to ask him if I can take this home and borrow it. And I said, Glenn, do you mind if I borrow this? I'll bring it back tomorrow. It won't be messed up. He goes, no, you can have it. So I took the magazine home. And I went home, did my normal thing, coming home, shower, work out, eat, sit around. And I started wanting to go to sleep. I grabbed the magazine. I was looking at it. And I thumbed through the back of it. And there was this little tiny little classified ad. It said, real money, real people call this 1-800 number and get free information. So I did. And in like a week, I got a little cassette tape. And obviously, many of the old people here, the old, old time students, they know that that was the Ken Roberts cartridge course that ended up buying, that put me on the mailing list of Larry Williams stuff, the rest of history. But when I started making money, trading, I was at that vending company during that nine months of, so naturally, because I was looking for any way to get out of that lifestyle, having to work, and I wanted to be able to put the middle finger up into that guy's dad's face, which I never did that, folks. I'm glad I didn't, because I'd probably regret it today, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to do it, because I did. But I wanted to uh, escape so badly that there was a a snowstorm and I was expected to go to work that day and I was in bed with my girlfriend who I was engaged to at the time and I thought to myself I make way more money than I make in a month a day now and I'm looking at this girl who's not my wife it was a younger relationship I was a young guy but I'm looking at her I'm thinking I want to marry this girl and I don't want to be doing what I'm doing. And she doesn't know what I'm doing. She thinks the only from the vending business. So when we go out to dinner and I'm taking her to nice restaurants to try to impress her and her parents, that day I just said, you know what, it's, I'm done. So we had pagers back. My boss was paging me. You know, they call in, call in, like you know. So I finally clicked on that. I'm not coming in today. It's snowed and it's bad here. And he's like, well, shovel out. I said, shovel out. Now, this is the sun, the one I did like. I said, Glenn, I can't shovel the friggin' streets. Like, it's everywhere, not just around my car. And I had a Z20 back then. So, uh, you just don't do a Z28 in this kind of snow we had. So he says, well, if you don't come in, you don't have a job. I said, well, that just made it a lot easier because I'm never coming back now. See you. And I didn't go pick up my check. It was four months before he mailed it to me. <laughs> uh, did it feel good to do it that day? Yes, because I didn't have a guilty conscience about it. That was the reason why I kept staying because I liked him. I liked him as a person, but that day killed it for me, which is, I guess, you know, God's way of saying it's time to go. So he let him show his colors to me, and I just rolled. And I just did it the way I wanted to, on my terms. They didn't They didn't say, we don't need you anymore, trash from Essex. Then their business went under. These folks that had uh, Section 8 housing, they lost all their, their housing because of reports about being slumlords. So all their wealth and things that made them feel rich and such, they don't have it no more. But I look at myself every Saturday, and it sounds venomous the way I'm saying it now. It's only because I'm talking to you like you're in the car with me right now. And I'm reliving these painful, emotional moments that were real. These are not made-up things, folks. I garbage, okay, just like all of you do. I was not exempt from that. You hear me talk, and it sounds like this guy was just pressed out of a mold. He never had any hardships. It was a silver spoon in his mouth. And this is, no. No, no, no. no. I had.
I knew when I was younger. And it's not because I'm lazy, because I'm not lazy. And people listening. How can you I'm a real person I'm through these things. Just like you're going through your things right now. And you'll think about this conversation when you're older and you have more experience behind you. And then when you've succeeded, you'll say, you know what? I remember that time when I was out there driving around, almost beat somebody's ass or almost running off a road. That day, he said some things that really resonated with me. And it made sense. At that time, later on, not so much meaningful to you right now because they're my experiences. Maybe you don't have the hardships that you live with. And this is temporary. Don't let other people around you look down on you and make you think that that's where you're supposed to be. No. You are not where you are right now. You found me because you were supposed to find me. We crossed paths because you were expected to use what it is I'm teaching. You didn't find me by chance. Do I ever advertise? No. You ever seen any ads? Nope. No coupon codes, no special deals, no deadline. If you don't do it by this time, that's all garbage. That's people that need to sell. I don't need to sell shit. And when you taste what it is that I'm selling, it's real. And then when it's given to you for free, that's treasure. Look how many people are literally energized now. They're able to see it. And all it took for them is to literally engage. Take me for my word only on the basis of test and see if it's true. It costs you nothing but time. If I'm a fraud, if it doesn't work, you'll know right away. I didn't have that, folks. I didn't have those things. Hang on. trying to run him over in the uh, fire engine. See that? When's the last time your mentor took you on a road trip like this? <laughs> Almost had cops show up. So <laughs> when you go through these moments where you feel like you're not going to be able to do this, just know that I had those all the time. And I had good, well-meaning people around me and they didn't inspire me. In fact, they were weights around my neck. They kept me from being positive. I had to dig in deep on myself. And it was me basically going to war with that guy's perception of me. You got to watch those guys from Essex, Maryland. Like I'm some freaking meth head selling crack on a corner somewhere. I was a model employee. Like that's like that's the guy you want that never misses a day, that works over and doesn't expect anything extra, and believes that in the in time that the employer will reward them for their loyalty and work ethic. And I was taken advantage of. But guess what? I'm not complaining about that. I'm glad it shaped me into who. That's who I was before I started working for them. My grandfather made that in me. So college is a fucking scam. It's a scam. You will not go to college now. Get a career making a high degree of income with a great degree of consistency and longevity because your business is not guaranteed to you. What did 2020 show you? The rules have changed. A second one here. I don't see any smoke, but I'm bringing it today. My Lamborghini, hey, brother, I see you. Um, the world's changed, folks. And when I started talking in 2016 about what was coming, 
I got laughed at. Chicken Little. But I said everybody on Twitter said everybody needs to get ready because they're going to do something that's worse than 9-11. And it's coming. I said that in July of 2019 again. And in October, I said it also. And then he started censoring my posts on Twitter, and that's the reason why I left. I did not get run off of Twitter, because guess what, brother? I'm right here. Bring your shit. I'm right here waiting. Everybody can talk to me. Everybody can say what they want to say, and I'm right here to answer all of that. So on Saturdays, I take a drive, and I get to reflect on the choices I made, just like I tell you to on those community posts. You got to look back and think, where have you been? What are you doing right now? Where are you heading? Are you still on, are you still on task? Have you lost your bearings? Are you lost? Do you even know what you're doing? Did you even do anything last week that contributed to growing? It's not just watching videos. It's not looking at tweets and community posts. It's you rolling your sleeves up and getting out there and getting dirty in. Doing it wrong and learning from that. That's the part that I thought was the prevention for me to like, I looked at it like, I'm never going to get this. I'm never going to get this. And my aunt would come in and knock on the door and hear me weeping in there. Like, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just frustrated. What's wrong? I, you won't understand. And she wouldn't have. Even my uncle wouldn't have understood. Because I was trading my money, doing trades that I could not really realistically afford. And when they went bad, they were bad. But when they were good... I contained that, and I kept telling myself, this is how you keep going. When they look at you, and they look down at you, and they think that you're a friggin' bum, that you're never going to amount to anything because you live below your means, guess what? They don't know the real you. They can't see the real you. The real you is that person that knows that you don't have it yet right now. You know it right now. You don't have your power to do it yet, but you know you're getting there. And you're not gonna take no for an answer. You're not gonna be like, no one's gonna convince you that you can't do it. No one's gonna sell you an idea that's gonna distract you and prolong the process. You know that you know that you know. Once you get that mindset, that's what's needed. You need to be doing that. Once you arrive at that point, it's just a matter of time, folks. It's just a matter of time, and how much time is it going to be? Mm, I don't know. It's everybody's different. But I can tell you I had a plan that I did not want to be working when I was 40 years old. So I was willing to give up at that time half of my life to get to where I wanted to be at. And where I wanted to be at was financially independent. And I started with trying to earn and save $1,000 a month. And folks... That shit got real easy. Real, real easy. And then when you start getting these mile markers, you don't need cheerleaders around you. You don't need anybody to tell you, that a boy, that a girl, you're going to do it. Keep doing what you're doing. Because your bank account tells you that. Your bank account tells you, you're doing shit right, man. <laughs> who cares who believes you? Who co- who, who's going to convince you when you got millions of dollars in the bank, who who do you need to tell you that you finally arrived? You need somebody to talk to you? You need Tony Robbins to talk to you about how you're doing a good job? You got seven digits floating around in multiple banks. You need Tony Robbins to tell you you're doing a good job. No, 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 no. You don't need that. All you need to do is show up, put the work in, and do it consistently. If you do that, look around, folks. These people that are just now discovering themselves and what I'm teaching, nobody's going to convince them otherwise now. They tasted it already. 
They've already tasted it. They know what it feels like now. No one's convincing them otherwise. They're never going to be told what they're doing is the wrong way now. All I've ever invited everyone to do. If you do that, I promise you, I guarantee you, you will never, ever, ever, ever put this down again. Because once it bites you, you're infected. You just accept it now. It's a way of life. These markets are in your blood. And guess what? Some days, you ain't right. I had a friend when I was growing up said, it ain't, well, how do you say it? <laughs> it ain't right if it ain't rough. Or, or uh, it's not, uh, that's not how he said it. He says, it's not rough if it's not right if it's not rough. Right, something that effect, and it's kind of like trading. If it's easy, you probably are doing something that isn't going to be sustainable, like it was for me in 1993. That was that was luck. It ain't rough if it ain't right. That was the expression he used to always tell me. And I had this, uh, a young guy. I would complain to him. I'd be like, you know, where do you see us growing up and being later in life? He goes, I don't know. I'm just living right now. And as cool as it sounded back then, that scared the hell out of me. Because I needed to know. <laughs> I needed to know where I was going to be at. Like, I don't want to be homeless. You know, I want to make sure I can survive. And I'm thankful that I don't have that worry anymore. And I want all of you to have that feeling, that sense of accomplishment. There's a lot of folks in here that don't want to hear this part, but it's the truth. If you don't live right, if you don't do the right things to other people, because listen, and Denny, you hear me. I appreciate you coming out and saying that the things that you've been making ad revenue on, and yes, you do make ad revenue. Those things that you say about me, you came out recently, they're not true. And I appreciate that. But because you profess in whom you believe, that's the reason why I haven't touched you. That's why I won't come back and say anything to you. Touch not my own. I don't do that to a brother in Christ. And I understand what you're doing. You want attention and traffic. I get it. But the things you said, everyone knows and you know too, aren't true. But I have been a blessed man. My entire life, I've had so many blessings, not just in the markets, not in trading, not just in relationships, but my source, my real secret is my relationship with Christ. That's it. And I'm not, I'm not, I've always said this before. I'm not a poster child for Christianity. I'm not the, the model Christian, as you can see when I get chemically imbalanced. <laughs> I lose control of my tongue sometimes. I'm like Peter many times. I got foot and mouth disease. You know, I open my mouth, put my foot right in it. But my, and when I talk to all of you, I'm talking to you like you are my best friend or my son or my daughter. And I think you can hear it when I'm talking to you because I mean what I say. And I lived these experiences. I've done these things. And I'm not asking anything for it. I've proven that. I've did millions and millions of dollars a year for six years, and I chose to stop. I guarantee you, if I went on Twitter right now and said, okay, I'm opening up shop right now, and in Jesus' name, I swear to God, I'm never doing this again. But I, I'm telling you, if I did it right now and posted it on Twitter, i will open up the mentorship again, even if I doubled the price, I'd probably have millions of dollars in the PayPal account before Monday. This is the way it is. And you should be thankful that I don't do that. I don't need to do that. I don't want to do it. So if my if my experience was I see this guy, he comes out and says these things that I do, and then watch all these other people prove that they can do it. They're recording their entries, their management on YouTube. That should encourage you. And then to watch this person step away from making millions of easy money. It's real easy. 
but it's hard managing all the personalities. So if I'm going to manage all your personalities, I'm going to do it where there's no business tie between us. And we understand that the work is all yours. And you know I'm motivated because I love doing this. And you want someone to teach you that's passionate. You want somebody that's be basically lukewarm? No. You want somebody that's on fire, that literally lives and breathes this stuff. And I have done that for 30 years. I absolutely love this industry. I love this business. I love the people. I love the whole, the whole idea of it, the lifestyle, everything. And it isn't about Lambo lifestyle. It's about peace of mind knowing that I don't need your friggin' paychecks. I don't need to ask for permission if I can go on vacation. I'm going to tell you how much money I'm making this week. You aren't setting a limit on how much money I'm going to make. That's a mindset that nobody can understand or appreciate until they live that. And I'm trying my damnedest to do that for all of you. I'm providing the tools. That I'm blazing the trail for you. All you got to do is keep up with me. Just keep up. That's all you got to do. Show up every day. Do the things I'm telling you to do and don't do the things I tell you not to do. If you do those things, I promise you, you will get this. And once you have it, it's yours. Nobody can take it from you. Nobody can say, you aren't going to amount to shit. You're going to be just like the rest of us working shit jobs, because guess where that came from? An uncle in my family. Well, he was digging graves in Holly Hill Cemetery when he retired. I'm digging graves on the people on the other side of my trades. Like it or don't, this is the way it is. I'm going to have analogies that make it seem like it's a sport. That's on you. But I've always looked at this as war. It's always been war. Because I've wrestled with demons inside me as a young boy. And that's what motivated me. I didn't have a hero. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a guy that could sit out here and encourage me and talk about something before it happens and it unfolds precisely. Week after week after week. You guys are fortunate. And I'm blessed to be that person for you. I love it. I love it. So in a lot of ways, I guess God prepared me to be this person because I had to go through a lot of this stuff to understand and appreciate what it is that you're in a mentor. And you may not even realize what it is you're looking for until you see me. Once you taste this kind of way of learning, there's no other way of doing it. It just makes sense. If I tell yourself here, stop there, you've learned nothing but to trust my decisions. But if I take you to the chart and I say, look, here, if it's above where we are, I'm, I'm biased, I'm biased, I'm looking for, I need to go to that level. No, there's a learning in that. How many times have you seen me call something and it didn't come to fruition? Not many. My son, uh, obviously, <laughs> some of the guys out there, they're afraid that their all count challenge is going to get trumped by my son, who was a neophyte. I think I've already done that so far. The um, broker that my son uses reached out to him and said, Two things you need circuit trader, Michael J. Huddles, and your father. And is he posting your statements? And how does he have access to your statements? And we're probably going to close your account if you do have a response. And respond to each one independently. So, what difference does it make if I'm his father? And who the fuck business is it if he wants to put his own trade statements in my email box or put them online if he wants to? I've never seen a broker ever say something like that. Like, why wouldn't they want someone that shows accountability? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Now, 
He hasn't reported any trouble whatsoever with them clearing his trades. So I was kind of shocked when he pushed it and texted me, showing him, hey, Dad, this is what they emailed me. What do I do? He replied to him, telling the truth. You're going to lie to him. What are you going to lie for? I think, <laughs> I think they're afraid that uh, it's me behind his trades and that would be against the law and no, that's not going on. And how else would someone that entered and opened the account up admitting that they don't have any experience all of a sudden runs up from the lows he had that month? I was, I was broke, I'd be wondering too. But he's pushing the buttons. And if they choose to close his account, that's fine. There's plenty of other brokers out there. But as far as what he's trading, I sit with him. I explain to him how certain moves form, kind of like what I've done with you, and all the basic stuff. And no, he's not trading Enigma. He wouldn't even understand Enigma unless he gets in the marketplace. He has to taste it, see it, live and breathe it, take money from the market and have money taken from him. You have to have those experiences. And I put him in those situations with conversations saying, what do you think would happen if you went in right here? And he's excited to get in a trade. Like he's not in a rush to get in. If anything, he's reluctant. So I know what he's afraid of. He's afraid of getting it wrong. In my eyes, he doesn't want to fail. And I can't stress this enough, Caleb. You have made me so proud. The fact that you're doing it, I love that. I know he's going to succeed because I'm going to fucking guarantee it. But it's hard for me to him because he wants to walk in my sight flawlessly. And I don't expect that of any of my kids. And when you have kids, or if you have them, you know what it means to feel that. They can't, they can't do any, anything wrong because they're your kids. They make me bad decisions. But they're still your kids. But with this, I have waited so long for this. And I'm pouring my every to him. And I don't want him to be fearful of losing. Fearful of losing. Losing, that is a tax on success. You're going to have losings, man. This is the way it is. I lose. I get it wrong. It doesn't matter. I still beat their ass. That's the way you have to look at it. Every sports team, every sport, they don't win every down, every inning, every whatever the hell it is. I'm, I'm not even a sports fan. I'm trying to draw out other analogies because some of you don't like to hear the war story stuff. But every day isn't going to be a winning day. And I want him to understand that if he does this and he has a losing day, I'm not looking down on him on that. I want to see, does it affect you on the other side of that loss? That's what I'm interested in as his father and as his instructor in terms of trading. I want to see how does it affect him mentally? Because I'm going to tell you right now, when I was younger, when I lost, I was pissed off. I hated everybody. I could have easily snapped the neck of somebody that would have came up to me as soon as I dusted $3,500 on a trade that I knew damn well 20 minutes before I should have got out of that thing. But now the next person that speaks to me, it's his fault. <laughs> you did this to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So many wives and girlfriends and boyfriends have suffered <laughs> so many times. at that time cause that pain and you want to find some way to put an outlet on it that takes it away from you but that's what trading is you eat it and you swallow it it's good medicine because it makes you the trader that bad stuff that happens to you that's what every wildly profitable trader has done a lot of they ate that they took those shots and they kept going. That's why many of you are absolutely going to you're gonna find that this is the most impossible thing for you to do. And it's impossible for everybody in the beginning until you get that mindset I mentioned earlier. 
where, you know what? Nothing's going to deter me from doing this. I know it's going to feel like I want to quit sometimes. It's going to feel like this is a bunch of shit. I can't do it. I can't learn this. I'm frustrated. It didn't do what I want. I don't even know what the hell the bias is. Everybody's asking all the time, bias, bias, bias. I am literally teaching you bias, folks. I'm taking you into the chart telling you. Here it is. This is what I'm pointing to. If it's above the market, is that a bearish bias? No. Nope. If I'm pointing below the market price, and I'm saying, look at this level here, note that. Is that bullish? No. I'm teaching you by doing it with you. I'm showing you. I'm teaching you how to avoid when you're going to blow your account. I know that intimately. I did a lot of that in the 90s. I got no problem telling you. I got medals. I got purple hearts, okay, for blown out accounts in the 1990s. I did it in stunning fashion. It was style. I did it while I'm in a truck, working 13 hours a day, eating, driving with my left foot laying on the steering wheel, going over the key bridge. High winds. That's like trading full margin, no stop. And that's how I was trading market. Crude oil market. Gold features. I've done all that stuff and losing my ass the whole time doing it. Well, blew that account. It's going to take me six weeks to save up another. Well, they did, but guess what? Nobody could have told me ever that was a dumb decision because I knew in my heart I have tasted what it feels like to win. And those wins were more than my monthly income gross. Let that bug bite you. And it'll never leave you alone. It'll never, ever leave you alone. So you might as well just roll your sleeves up, accept the fact that it's going to take some work, it's going to take some effort on your part, put in the time and the work, defer all your weekend warrior stuff that you want to hang out with your buddies and go out with your girlfriends and go buy what's on sale. Stop all that. Invest your time and your money in yourself. Because I'm telling you right now, there isn't anybody, there, I don't know anybody that went to college that makes as much money as I have. I don't know anybody like that. College didn't do that for them. Now, business owners, yeah, that's the way you do it. But employees, mm -mm. my opinion is even an average consistently profitable trader will slap the money bags out of the best of any employee of any company. Because you're not limited. That company says how much you're going to make. You're an employee. You're subservient. I'm not subservient to anybody. Well, the Lord. But outside of him, I ain't got to listen to nobody. Nobody tells me what my schedule is. No one tells me what I can and can't. Nobody puts a limit on how much I can earn. And folks, listen. I got out of the teaching business, but I could roll right into a signal service right now. I'm not going to, just so you know. But if you learn how to do this, you don't need to have money to do it. You don't need to learn the skill set and then prove to everyone online that you can do it consistently. I guarantee you they will throw money at you. They will throw it at you if they could just watch what you're doing beforehand. I teach this with my students all the time. I have a lot of folks that are literally barely scraping by. There's no way they're going to open up a $100,000 trading account. They're not. So those funded accounts, I think they're a good idea. Are they all good? No. Do I have a reputation uh, of doing business with them? No, I've never done anything. We'll never tell you this company or that company over another. But the skill set, once you know it, Folks, listen, man, this is not hype. Like, this is really real. You can sit in front of a chart, determine where it's going to go, where it's not going to go, and it delivers consistently. That's a skill set very, very few people can do on this planet. Even the folks that are outside what I teach and they're consistently profitable, you have a system. You know that you are part of a society that is so minuscule. We're like the League of Ex uh, you know, Extraordinary Gentlemen. And, and gentle ladies, please don't get on me about the gender stuff. It is what it is with me. But you're an exceptional breed of person. 
if you can sit down and interpret these charts and read the tea leaves and you earn those strikes, whether you're doing what I do or another way of doing it. Now, I ain't going to knock anybody that's consistently making money. Who can do that? Nobody should. Nobody Nobody has anything to say anything about anybody that's making money. Because if you're making bread doing this stuff, you arrived. Nobody's going to tell you different. So I drive around on Saturday, and I think about how I'm going to improve my son. And I basically congratulate myself every week. Kind of like Snoop Dogg, I like to thank myself. I like to thank me. I like to thank myself. I do that, but also I talk to God. I thank him for most of everything I have is his. He gives it to me. But the model my son's working on, this is the second Lamborghini I saw. <laughs> yeah. There's a green one earlier when I said it, and I was like, one there. I'm up here uh, by Russia Town Road. I took the same drive up to the Krispy Kreme that uh, the private investigators that never got paid follow me around. <laughs> I got a twisted knife when I can, folks. But I talk to my son a lot about what he wants to do, like where he sees himself. Now, he obviously knows that we can live way, way more affluent than I do. He, because he's been working, you know, a menial warehouse job, work second shift. I think he goes in three o'clock and gets off. At eleven is a normal end time. Sometimes they keep him over if there's things they got to finish. And he does all the heavy lifting part. He stacks up stuff, puts it on pallets, and he's not doing an easy job for a lot of money. It's for him because he's not, you know, he's not muscular. He's not built like a shit brick house. He's literally, you know, a young thin guy. So he's working hard, back hurts him all the time now. And I knew if I left him in it long enough, he would come to me with that desire to, that I... And outwardly, some of you out here may be judgmental about that, but tell me, I'll tell you this, when I was raised by my grandfather, because my father is absolutely a contract murderer, his name is Michael Joe Howington. He is serving two consecutive life sentences, plus 20 years, and he picked up more time when he broke out of Maryland Penitentiary in 1983. Okay, so there you go. My grandfather raised me, and he raised me as a hard-line Navy man. Laziness was not accepted. You have because you earned it. If you didn't earn it, you don't have it. And when I was younger, I was going to just give money to my kids, and I talked about how I was going to do it openly. And a lot of folks read, hey, look, you know, you think this is a good idea. And at first I was pissed off, like, hell, you tell me how to raise my kids. But one guy sat and wrote an email to me one day. He says to me, he says, like, Michael, you know, I, I love what you do. I think you're a, a genuinely nice guy, but I don't think it's a good idea for you to give your kids money. You should make them earn it. And he went through a list of reasons why, blah, blah, blah. And he actually talked about how he was given money by his father. And he went all the wrong directions. And in fact, that's what got my father where he was. My birth biological father, Michael Joe Howington, who is again in Jessup, Maryland, Maryland House of Corrections. Look it up if you want to, do the research on it. He was a murderer. He did it for money because he had a heroin addiction that he picked up when he was in Vietnam. Before he went to Vietnam, he was drafted. He didn't want to join it. My, mo uh, my mother and him got together. Obviously, he was one of those guys that came from a family that had money. Not a lot of money, but they had money. And they gave him the apartment. They set him up, and they got him a car, several cars, always gave him cash. And he was spoiled. And he did shit that, you know, spoiled people do made stupid decisions. He got married and then slept with my mom when she was underage. Supposed to be born. She was going to abort me. He told her, I'm going to cut your throat ear to ear if you kill that baby. And that's the reason why you hear my voice. That's the only thing my father did for me. 
He's never spent any time with me. He never did anything with me, ever. But my grandfather raised me. I lived with him. So, my son Caleb, I pushed him into a similar step. He has grandparents that are not doing well. My mother-in-law, she has cancer. Lung cancer, she's got like half of one lung, a little less than half of one lung. And her husband is failing. Like, we don't even know how long he's going to be around. We're surprised he's still here. So my son does two things. He lives with them to help them. In many ways, like a hospice. Not that they're on their deathbed, but he does a lot of things for them that they can physically do. And he works his second shift job when they are resting in the evening time. So for the assholes out there that try to judge my parenting or my kids, none of my kids are profitable, successful millionaire traders, but I'm about to make one of them. My oldest son, invested in crypto made a little bit of money last year and i told him get out please listen to me son nope this is the way it is we had a falling out because he wanted a house and set him up with cash and he wanted to be like my dad and i told him i'm not going to do that and we have not talked since then he does things in his life that i would and some of them could get him in trouble but he doesn't listen but he's his own man and he'll have to take these consequences. But he has lost a lot of his money because he didn't listen. I told all of you crypto was going to crash. I don't trade crypto, so please stop asking me about it. I'm not going to talk about how my concepts work or don't work in them. I don't believe in crypto. So if you're trading crypto and you made money, congratulations. But don't attribute it to me because I didn't help you do it. But if you lose money, don't complain to me because I said don't eat it. But I say to my son, Caleb, all the time, I'm like, look, you've never complained about any of the things that you're going through right now. And that's exactly how I was. I didn't complain that I had to stay within an earshot. That I had to be right around the corner to take my grandmother to the bathroom because she couldn't walk. I didn't complain about that. I just thought that's what I had to do. What was I going to compare it to? I didn't have anything else to compare it to. Just like... Caleb. So now he has the right mindset. Out of all my children, he has the right mindset. He has worked menial jobs and made nothing. Hates his freaking career, okay? Because it, it's not even a career. It barely gives him any money. His back hurts every single day. And he wants to finally do his own thing. That's the fertile mind that I need. He knows what it tastes like to be living like that. He never one time complained, Dad, can you just do this for me? He's never asked me for anything. He's never done that. My other kids always ask. <laughs> That's normal, I guess. But Caleb wants to just be able to earn enough money to not worry about money. He's not even trying to be rich. And that's how you get rich. Hear that, folks? You get rich when you don't try to get rich. When you do something with, with passion that you want to do well because you enjoy it and you love it, you need to make trading like that. And that starts by doing analysis and loving the analysis, back testing, reading price charts, and just pouring over top of it and not finding anything else that would be more interesting except for your relationships. Because they're important. You've got to balance that. I've been going for a while. I've got to wrap this up here in a couple minutes. But I asked him, I said, you know, I think you're in the right mindset now. I think you have got to the point where you're mature and I think if you sit down with that and literally watch the charts with me and I show you certain things I believe you'll be able to do this but I need to make sure that you bring your own personality into this 
So, character and to describe him, he's he's socially awkward. He's introverted like I am. But if he's comfortable with like me, I'll just go on and on and on and shut up. Never. Okay, I, I stop talking when I'm asleep. He's the same way. But if he's not comfortable, he won't speak at all. And that's how I am. If I don't know something about something, I don't talk about it. I don't, and my kids will tell you that. No. If dad's not talking about him, we know he doesn't know anything about that because he's not saying anything. But if it's about the word, the Bible, God, or anything like that, I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and never run out of anything else to say. And it's, it's I don't know, that's the way I'm wired. He's like that. He doesn't have a lot of friends. He's got one friend. That's how it was when I was younger. I had one friend, Sean. He, my son, Caleb, he is not confident in himself. And he's unsure about a lot of the decisions that he's going to make. And channels that into his charting ideas. He doesn't want to do it wrong in front of me. So what I'm focusing on is fixing those issues. And it won't be an easy fix. It's probably going to take the rest of the year, if not longer, to overcome that. And you probably know what that feels like. It's even if you're trading the smallest of leverage, you don't want to be wrong. Not because you're in front of your father, but because being wrong sucks. But you need to have someone to remind you that being wrong is part of this, and it doesn't end your career. It doesn't stop you, folks. It does if you over-leverage and you over-trade and you just go crazy. Yeah, those individual incremental losing positions will take you out of the game. That's what I was teaching you this week. This is the kind of week every single month that will do that to you. If you push too hard, you'll lose your account. Look through the tweets. Stay in Friday. Regret. Not a lot of them. I mean, most of them are like, this is great. This is great. Yes, that's awesome. But there's people in here that say, I wish I would have listened to you. And that's the person I'm talking to right now. I'm not talking to the person that already knows my stuff works and making money. I, that's not you're not my audience right now. I'm talking to the folks that are on the fence or about ready to throw in the towel and say, I can't do this. No, you can. And you're not gonna quit. It is bitching. Bitching's part of it. I bitched and quit so many times in, in the nineties. I quit <laughs> every three months I quit. I quit every single time until I had enough money to open up another account. That's exactly what I was doing. I was quitting until I had enough margin <laughs> to open up another account. So you can no. Nope. That's addicted. And you have to be an addict in this to stick with it. Because cheerleaders don't exist in this. It doesn't work like that. You have to cheerlead yourself. You got to be the person that says, you know what? I'm worth doing this for. And it doesn't seem conventional. It doesn't make any sense that you would expect to sit in front of these charts and look at these lines wiggling and waggling and expect them to be translating into income going into your bank account. But guess what, folks? That's exactly when you do it right. That's exactly what happens. But, but, if you do it wrong, and you will do it wrong, I do it wrong. You're going to do it wrong. Or sometimes the market's just going to suddenly do something that you didn't expect. And guess what? That usually happens when I'm from here a week for me. So that's the reason why I don't trade it. Period. It's simple. I don't know why it's hard for some of you to get that logic. It's, I don't have an edge in those, in those days. You might. Congratulations. Kudos to you. I'm not knocking you if you can. I'm not here, I'm not here trying to size up anybody because you made money on Thursday and Friday. I'm not, I don't care about that. But my son, he, because he's indecisive, because he's unsure about himself, I'm kind of like guiding him into a model that seeks five points. And again, I gave an example. Someone asked him on Twitter, and I replied to it earlier this morning. Um, you know, what does that mean? I said for, like, he wants to trade just the E-man and S&P, which, because he's already tasted the uh, NASDAQ, and it moves a little too quick for him. doesn't like that fast movement. He'll like it later on. <laughs> but uh, right now, ES is a little bit more subdued. 
but it can be wild when it needs to be. But five points in the morning would be like buying it 41 even or 4100 on the even SP and then having a limit order to sell it at 4105. So you would get five points times $50 on one contract, 250 bucks. So I'm trying to give him a model that repeats that once in the morning, in the afternoon. He's going to be going in every single day looking for it, but it has to have certain rules and, and expectations. And once we settle in on that, I promise you, I will share what it is he's doing because I'm going to tell you what he's made with it. So it's not a demo account. Okay. Um, if we have to use a different broker and it say, like say uh, AMP closes his account, I'm going to make their uh, statements that he should give me. I'm going to give him the, 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 the form with me to show him anyway. So they're not stopping that. Okay. But to keep his account open and let them sleep at night by not posting it while he's trading with them, then he won't do it. But I don't need to make anything photoshopped or fake. You know, if I'm going to photoshop something, you know, I'm going to photoshop, you know, um, a mustache or a beard, you know, <laughs> something stupid. Uh, trading, I don't need to make anything fake about that. Okay, I can do it. And just like you're learning, you're going to learn how to do it. And it's fun. When people doubt you, I know a lot of, a lot of young guys uh, want to get out here and just smash everybody's head. You ever ask yourself why you want to do that? Why, what is it about? Because some of you really want to go out there and vehemently defend me. Like, I need you to defend my honor. <laughs> you know, I don't need that. I, mean, I enjoy it. Bottom line is this. If you feel like you got to go out there and prove yourself, listen, folks, this is for the young guys. And, Danny, this is you, too. You were scarred sometime in your life. You had something cut you so bad that you had something taken from you. Somebody that you loved cut you so deeply that now you have a wound that nothing can fill it except for you proving to them that you are better than they thought you were. You were worth more than they thought you were and then hurt you. And you want to prove it to them. But because you can't prove it to them, you're going to prove it to anybody and everyone that gets in front of you. And I tell you this because that's how I live my life. I can't. I can't wait to see him again and... and, and Embrace him and tell him, I missed you. And I hope that he's proud of me. I hear his words every day in my head. And it was hard growing up under him because he was strict. But it shaped me into who I am. And because I can't satisfy that urge to prove to him that he did good on me. When I was younger, I flexed on everybody. Everybody for it. And I'm about to turn 50 in a couple weeks. And it's weird when you start looking at that age. <laughs> And some of you young guys don't think it's going to happen to you anytime soon, but it's quick. It gets here real quick. You start looking at things differently, and things don't matter like they feel like they matter for you right now. I can get out here and do all kinds of things, folks. But when you're done doing it, payout isn't nowhere near as much as you expected it to be. And the bottom line is this, nobody cares. Nobody cares. So really, you're just doing it for yourself on reasons that aren't really worth it. So if you're in trading to prove your self-worth to somebody else, you're doing it wrong. You're going to do it wrong because of that. You're going to try to push too hard when you shouldn't. You're not going to follow the rules because 
you have a vendetta. You have something to prove. When it's a process that you have to follow, not I'm going to prove something to somebody else. No, because if you follow the process correctly, they'll trust me. If they're paying any attention to you, they'll notice it. To remind them of it. That's wisdom that comes when you start getting older. I didn't have that as a 20 year old. I don't care what people think of me anymore because I live my life. I live my life. I lived my life. I've done things that no employer could have gifted me with bonuses and salaries that would have ever taken me to a point where I could afford things I have now. And I have a skill set that no college would ever teach you. And guess what? The institution of ICT, this college, it's free, baby. There's no financial aid needed. It's show up and put the work in. We don't give diplomas around here. Your diploma is your account growing. That's your, that's your GPA. You want your GPA to be high. You work at that. Nobody gives that to you. You earn it here. And when you earn it, nobody can take it from you. Nobody can minimize it. Nobody can make fun of it. Nobody can talk down to you at all. When and that is what I'm trying to do with my son, Caleb. Because I know I'm going to turn this boy into a savage. I'm going to make this motherfucking boy so monstrous. He is absolutely going to rip the shit out of these markets. There ain't going to be nobody that's ever going to be able to step this boy. Nobody. And I guarantee you, I'm putting my fucking life on this. My son's fucking name is going to be on the historical board of that Live and Robbins Cup. And he's going to fucking destroy Larry Williams. How about that? Caleb Huddleston is going to fuck up Larry Williams' record. You know what? I'm going to celebrate like a motherfucker. I'm going to live stream that shit. When they fucking do the audit, he's going to do it. He's going to fucking do it. And I'm going to shove that straight up your fucking asses, you motherfucking trolls. And I'm going to lug him bit of it. I'm going to be the proudest papa you've ever fucking seen. I'm going to be prancing around like a fucking peacock. There ain't a fucking thing you can do about it. You ain't going to stop it. If you think you can fucking beat him, you fucking join it. You join it. I guarantee fucking you, you will never even come fucking close. You like that crescendo? <laughs> Until next time.